Uh, the meetings that I've been to recently have been the Oxygen Club of California, which uh, met in March in Santa Barbara. The American Aging... Can, can you hear me in the back? Yes. 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 The American Aging Association, which uh, was last week in San Diego. The Kronos Sarcopenia Workshop, which was held in a, a affiliation with the American Aging Association meeting, and it was last Friday in San Diego. Jim, would, you, would you explain? Some people don't know the word sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is muscle wasting, and uh, in particular age-related muscle wasting, yeah. and it's somewhat Good related idea. to the problems that astronauts and bedridden patients have, have where uh, they don't use their muscles, and they have atrophy, but when it's specifically age-related, they um, use um, sarcopenia as the word. Um, and the MIT Stanford uh, Venture Lab, which is happening next Tuesday, which those of you who have some interest in uh, in uh, biotechnology and uh, venture capital might want to arrange to attend. How do these work? That's right. Uh, and I guess in reverse order here, um, there's a, a workshop on sustainable biotech models going to be held next Tuesday, June 18th. If you pre-register, the fee is 35. If you come to the door, it's 40 bucks. <coughs> uh, I think pre-registration cutoff is tomorrow. Uh, and they're going to talk about uh, different models for biotechnology companies. There's the tools and data, or bioinformatics model, and there's the drug development model. So some companies are making their money by selling tools to other companies which are actually building drugs. And uh, some companies are making money selling data, uh, and some companies are making money building drugs. Uh, let's see, I told you about the Kronos Clinic and Research Foundation um, Sarcopenia Workshop. This is their website if you want to learn more about them, the Kronos Group with a K. Um, they talked a lot about exercise and activity, and uh, the emphasis was clearly more on resistance exercise than on jogging. And uh, they uh, had a number of uh, papers which explained how uh, resistance exercise actually um, activates certain uh, chain reactions of hormones which actually build muscle. Uh, and uh, they also talked about um, testosterone creams and uh, said that they felt that, um, this was news to me because I hadn't studied the subject, but that testosterone creams really can help build muscle. They said bodybuilders already know this. Um, and if you are past childbearing age, that it could be quite a good thing. If you're not past childbearing age, it, uh, it makes your gonads shrivel up and go away. But <laughs> don't put it. What's that? I don't put it on. <laughs> so if you're like uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, probably testosterone's a good thing. And uh, this came as a surprise to me because a lot of the, um, the press that I had seen earlier had, had uh, been negative about it. So I'm, I'm starting to come around towards this point of view for older folks, but it's probably not such a good thing for, for younger people. The um, abstracts book for that workshop is here, and uh, maybe in the break some of you might want to take a look through uh, some of the papers and, and presenters and see a little bit about what they had to say. And I'm going to just read you the topics because there's not really time to go through every paper, but just to give you a flavor for what's going on. Um, Problems in Solving Sarcopenia and Overview by Taylor Marcel of Kronos. Hormone Action in Skeletal Muscle, Basic Mechanisms and Effects of Aging. Uh, mechanisms of Muscular Atrophy and Strategies to Block Atrophy. So people that don't use their muscles lose them. And uh, there was a bit of discussion about whether it was type 1 or type 2 fibers and fast twitch or slow twitch. Um, apparently, an awful lot of um, hip uh, fractures among the elderly are caused because they will stumble as we all will, all will. but those of us with, uh, who are physically fit, when we stumble, we catch ourselves almost without thinking. And uh, people with muscle atrophy or sarcopenia, when they slip, they can't catch themselves and they go down and, and break their hips. Um, so keeping fit is very important for keeping out of the hospital. And uh, they, they mentioned again that uh, testosterone as well as resistance training each 
alone or together can be very effective in not only young people, but old people building muscles. And they showed a number of interesting photographs of 60 and 70 year old bodybuilders and people who were using weights and, uh, and resistance uh, to build muscle. Um, so testosterone isn't required, um, but uh, weight training is very strongly recommended. Uh, this was a company that sells weight training equipment and they put out this booklet which you can call their toll free number and get a copy of, which has about 50 different abstracts of research papers on how uh, strength training and resistance training can build muscle, even in people in nursing homes. That's the Konos group, what's, what's that the name? Now this is a group called um, K-E-I-S-E-R, Kaiser. Did you give the number? Oh, yeah, I think I can find it. Kaiser is in Fresno. Their toll-free number is 800-888-7009. You can call them and ask for a copy of the Strength Training and Aging Research Apps. <coughs> uh, John, one yeah. comment. Uh, I went eight months without any exercise because I couldn't walk and I had the hip replacement and all of that. You want to face the audience that is not here? Yeah, I was shocked by what, when I looked in the mirror, to look at my arms and my legs had gotten so small. I couldn't believe it could happen in that length of time, but it did. And uh, so I think the muscle wasting, I know the muscle wasting can happen in a short time. It's also been the experience of NASA astronauts and Russian cosmonauts in weight, weightlessness just for a few right. weeks, in fact. We don't think about it, but just living in gravity keeps our muscles in tone. Mm -hmm. But if we're lying in bed or floating around in a spaceship, the muscles uh, atrophy very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a talk about exercise aging and muscle protein metabolism. And they said for maximum muscle building, they recommend uh, eating a protein meal within one to three hours after resistance or heavy resistance exercise. And this is the optimum um, so that the, mus the proteins are in the bloodstream for the muscle to build a new muscle mass. Uh, there was a talk about oxidative stress and mitochondrial induced apoptosis and sarcopenia, which was kind of a technical talk about uh, what exactly kills the cells when they aren't used for a while. And apparently, oxidative stress builds up and, and uh, causes the cells to commit suicide, which the scientists call apoptosis or apoptosis. Um, they talked about hormone replacement, fewer cause or both. Um, for men, testosterone is, is very good for the muscles. For women, um, estrogen is uh, actually very good uh, for a number of body systems, including memory and cognitive enhancement. Um, and I guess uh, we can't really cross over, can we? Um, exercise in the master athlete. So they showed um, a number of people who have been exercising all their lives and are in very good shape as they get older. Um, <coughs> And uh, let's see. So those are, those were the talks that were given on Friday at the Sarcopenia workshop. And once again, uh, maybe in the break, some of you will want to look at that um, abstract. Now, the American Aging Association is uh, one of the largest uh, groups in the country um, that is a forum for scientists who research the biology of aging to get together and uh, share the results of their research. They meet um, once a year uh, in June, and this year they met in San Diego. Next year they're going to meet in Baltimore. Uh, each year the <coughs> program chairman picks a theme for the uh, conference, and this year it was uh, molecules to humans, um, <coughs> all the levels of aging. Next year it's going to be eating and aging because uh, Jim Joseph is going to be the program chairman next year, and uh, he's just written a book 
on uh, blueberries and other colored fruits and vegetables and how they all contain uh, uh, unique antioxidants with, uh, with uh, linked together uh, carbon rings, which act as free radical traps and also act as color traps, which is why they're colored. Uh, <laughs> he uh, mentioned that, that they had shown marvelous results with blueberries um, helping rats retain coordination and uh, retain memory and retain cognitive ability to run mazes and to swim and to balance on bars. And then he showed some fascinating slides where they actually took slices of rat brain and they found that blueberries had induced the brain cells to go through regeneration, which is phenomenal. That brain cells were actually going through non-cancerous non cell division, actually building new brain matter, which is an extraordinary result. How much brain matter? About half a cup a day human equivalent. Mm -hmm. Strawberries are also very good. So, in fact, he says, uh, get one of each color every day. <laughs> what, what's the name of the book, uh, Charles? His, his book, uh, I think it's the, the, color, um, the color test or something like that. I don't know. Look for Jim Joseph as the author. It just came out in the last month or so. <coughs> I think uh, Newsweek or Time had an article reviewing it, um, which I was looking at last night. It was Newsweek. Uh, Did you see it? Well, the last issue of Newsweek that's you can buy right now in the newsstands, there's a one page and it's, it's just exactly what you Yeah, that's about Jim Joseph's book, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John, when they uh, look at the brain, what part of the brain are they looking at? Uh, they were looking at several different sections, the uh, cortex and the hippocampus. Hippocampus being involved in memory and, and cortex involved in... And <coughs> Yeah. It was extraordinary. Extraordinary. <coughs> um, so at these meetings you see scientists and grad students, the, they have half an hour talks running three or four days and about eight hours a day. So you get about 16 talks a day, but then uh, they have a poster session and you get about a hundred different people who didn't have time to, to do lectures um, standing in front of their posters while you drink red wine and wander around and, and pick out the ones that uh, are of most interest to you. There's an abstract book that they publish and it's also available on their website, www.americanaging.org has every one of the abstracts that were at the meeting online. You can download it and print it out. So this is a tremendous resource. They've just gotten this up in the last couple of months. So now, from now on, all of their abstracts will be on the web. And uh, those of you who want to get more into this can, uh, can use that resource. Was that blueberry uh, research uh, presented earlier than as presented here? I, are Jim Joseph has been working on blueberries for years, along with Barbara Shukit Hale and, and some <coughs> other researchers. They, they uh, are employed by the United States Department of Agriculture Research Station in affiliation with Tufts University, where they do their nutritional research on berries. Um, and in the past years, they've reported on the ability of rats to balance on balancing beams and to swim in cold water mazes and things like this. But this was the first time that they had reported on neural regeneration caused by eating blueberries. Yeah? Did they say it has to be fresh blueberries? Uh, they actually feed their rats dried pellets. So they freeze dry the blueberries, grind them up, and put them in pellets so that they can compare the control diets and so forth, and, and they're stored at room temperature. Uh, frozen is probably at least as good as pellets, and fresh is probably at least as good as frozen, unless it's moldy, in which case frozen is better than fresh. Um, yeah. If it's a geologic acid, I mean, some of the companies like General are selling combinations of strawberries, blueberries, elderberries, and the highest ratio. And they all have geologic acid, but that's the thing they're looking for. Well, now we're getting into the, the religious wars of, of you know, is it, it, is it better to eat food or is it better to take extracts and pills? And I would say if you're in a situation where you can't get the food, take the extracts. Well, they're selling the, ex they're actually selling the food. In the powder. The then it's an extract, right? Yeah. Or is it a freeze dried powder? I'm not sure. <laughs> Harvey has a comment. Do they have any theories as to what the mechanism is? Uh, yeah, it's a very, it, it contains over a hundred different antioxidants. And that uh, some of them are actually given it, its blue color, which probably is, 
responsible for the French paradox of red wine also being uh, very good for you in moderation because it has the, these colored antioxidants. You just in regeneration of neurons? Um, my personal theory might be wrong, but if oxidative stress in the brain is responsible for neural degeneration, and if the normal condition of the brain is to be healing itself when it has problems, and oxidative stress is interfering with the natural healing and regeneration process, then these antioxidants, which make it past the blood-brain barrier to protect the brain from oxidative stress, would allow the neurons to do what they want to do anyway. That's my personal theory, but um, it hasn't been totally proven yet. Well, and yeah. I was asking about the brain during cell division because I thought I had read something about cortical cells continuing to divide. I don't remember where I read it. I haven't, I haven't bookmarked it or anything, but uh, uh, well, that was reported several months ago, I believe. When you study brain, and this is a little bit difficult, um, there are different kinds of cells in there. There are the neurons, which are the signal conducting cells, which have these long arms called axons and dendrites, so that they can touch other cells and they act like telephone wires. And then there are the supporting cells which surround them, and they're called by various names like glia and astrocytes and so forth. And they actually wrap around the neurons and shield them from the blood capillaries, which are bringing sugar and oxygen to the brain, so that any nutrient or drug which is in, destined to make it into the neurons has to be absorbed by the glia and then fed to the neurons. They act as a barrier, and this is called the blood-brain barrier. Um, so when you read about brain research and you s see that there's cell division going on, usually it's the glia that are dividing or certain types of stem cells rather than neurons because in order for a cell to divide, if it has these long arms, it has to retract its arms, become a, a spherical shape, go through cell division, and then reestablish its arms. And that is not often seen in living animals up to this point. So this was what was extraordinary, was he was seeing cell division of cells which in classical books of a few years ago would say never happens or only happens under extremely <coughs> rare cases of brain cancer. Um, those of you who, and many of you I'm sure do, have a strong interest in subjects of the biology of aging and the development of interventions into aging might want to consider becoming a member of the American Aging Association just to be better in contact with the cutting edge scientists and grad students who are doing this work at um, universities and laboratories across the country and even from other countries. We had a couple of uh, people from Japan and England at the meeting this year. Um, if you want to become a member without subscribing to the journal, it's 50 bucks a year. If you want to subscribe to their journal and be a member, it's 110 bucks a year. And they take a little bit off of the uh, registration fee for the annual conference if you want to attend that. And if, if nothing else, it uh, helps to support um, the programs of the uh, association, which include holding the annual conference and providing support to graduate students who otherwise couldn't afford to attend, and uh, providing prizes for the best research among graduate students. So it gives them an incentive to study aging rather than going off and studying something else. When's the next meeting? Where does it happen already? Uh, next June in Baltimore. Oh, next June. Yeah. I just got back this past weekend from the one in San Diego. John, question. Yeah. Is, uh, does oxidative stress cause inflammation? Oxidative stress and inflammation are very closely related. Uh, there probably is a causal connection, and they both are implicated in neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And uh, there's a lot of accumulating evidence that antioxidants, if they can get into the brain, can be beneficial, and that anti-inflammatories, if they can get into the brain, can be beneficial. Um, and it seems uh, that just something as cheap and simple as uh, low doses of ibuprofen can be very effective because it's an anti-inflammatory. And the various types of uh, antioxidants, including the blueberries I've mentioned, so can be very effective. The system is working together on the antioxidants and the anti-inflammatory? 
Yes, yeah, they can uh, synergize with each other. And inflammation itself is a tremendously complicated <coughs> process, which I'm just beginning to learn about. But it involves the release by six cells of signaling compounds, which call upon white blood cells and astrocytes um, of the immune system to come over and try and eat up the sick cell. And you end up with a cascade, and they call it inflammation because when you look at it, the, the area affected is reddish and hot. And so this combination of uh, um, excitatory cytokines uh, in a feedback loop attracting macrophages and other white blood cells which then secrete other cytokines. There's like all in all 20 or 30 different compounds released and the result is that it triggers surrounding cells to become sick and die as well. So you can get a spread of, of cell death as a result and they start to release calcium and glutamate and other things causing excitotoxicity. Yeah? Just, just while we're on the subject of inflammation and Alzheimer's, uh, I brought some reprints of an article on uh, curcumin okay. and Alzheimer's because curcumin, like blueberries, has come, come out of nowhere you know, and just, beca just become a phenomenal success story. So I invite everybody to check that out. Okay, well, that's, that's something that I look forward to learning about because I don't know much about that particular. Yeah, it's just brand new stuff. It's inflammatory. Oh, okay. It's been in the life extension for five years now, <coughs> doing that. The in, the in the last year, life extension recommends that everybody take one 200 milligram ibuprofen a day to avoid Alzheimer's. Oh, that's interesting. I'm, I've been more conservative. I'm taking a quarter tablet a day just because I wanted to start out slow. <laughs> but, uh, so are you taking it? Yes, I'm taking it. 200 a day? I How many people in the room are taking ibuprofen daily or aspirin daily? I keep forgetting. I'm sorry. I'm taking your food. Would you like to do that? No. No, no we want to be able to see the screen. Thing. <coughs> at the Indian, at the various Indian grocery stores, you can get uh, turmeric. I get it. I regularly drop it in my food. Yes, yeah, same thing. Yeah. And, and uh, it isn't expensive, and uh, you may you may be way ahead to just do that. Yeah, another inexpensive anti-inflammatory is aspirin, and um, that's as effective as ibuprofen, but it also thins the blood. And since I'm taking so much ginkgo biloba, when I take aspirin on top of ginkgo biloba. I get bruises in my wrists and <coughs> that's probably not a healthy thing because if I get blood leaks in my brain that would be dangerous. So I switched to uh, ibuprofen and now I don't bruise and probably my brain's in better shape as a result. At least I hope so. Um, with, with, uh, with regard to the ibuprofen, I've also heard though that there may be problems with liver damage. So if you might want to check that out before you go on to the chronic. Well, I'm, yeah, it's, it's wise to keep abreast of whether any toxicity show up. Certainly there's uh, liver toxicity associated with Tylenol, and uh, liver damage does stand to be proven with ibuprofen. We want to keep an eye on that. That's acetaminophen. Yeah, it's a different compound than ibuprofen. Totally different and much more dangerous. Yeah. So anybody taking Tylenol? My suggestion is uh, maybe switch to ibuprofen instead. Jen, uh, question. Oh, I, yeah. I just had a question that might be related to that, and that is the uh, blood-brain barrier, the tissue. Uh, have there been studies on how that might change as we age? Does it let you know, larger molecules through as we get older, when uh, we're younger? Uh, I'm not a, enough of a neurobiologist to answer your question precisely, so I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Curious about <laughs> um, So, just as I did with the Kronos workshop, uh, I'm not going to read you every study that was presented, but I'm going to take you through the, the uh, program just with the titles of some of the talks so you get an idea of what is going on at that meeting. And you can, once again, go to their website and download the abstracts. And, if you see an interesting abstract, a, a real interesting trick is to write down the name of that author, or cut and paste the name of that author, and then switch web, web pages, go to Medline, which is run by our taxpayer dollars at the National Institutes of Health, National Library of Medicine. And this is a wonderful resource for looking up scientific articles 
from over 100 different uh, um, scholarly journals uh, in the field of biomedical science and clinical science. Uh, and I'll give you the, that website in a minute. But you can uh, find out which professors interest you and type them last name, space, first initial into Medline and uh, get a list of all the papers that they've published. And then uh, you can even get abstracts off of Medline. And if you really like the abstract, then you can go over to Lane Library at Stanford or your favorite medical library in Xerox. Don't you have to pay to get into Lane? No. Yeah. no. Lane, yeah. you can get into get six, times, time six times or seven times a year for free. And then it's $5 a time after that. Well, last time I was in the Medline, you could also download download directly online, but it just cost you a couple of dollars, which is cheaper than going to the library. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's also true. And uh, also Stanford Library, because they're, they buy a subscription to of many of these journals, if you decide there are a couple of articles you're really interested in, and, and rather than Xeroxing them out of the journal, you can go over to one of the computers inside the library download it to the printer there and it's 10 cents a page. So I guess it's sort of 10 cents a page no matter what you do really. Yeah. There's also the library on the third floor at the Palo Alto <coughs> Medical Foundation. Ah. And you can go in there free and they'll, they'll do photocopying and make other copies for you. Thank you. That's an excellent resource. All right. <coughs> third floor at the Palo Alto, Palo Alto Medical Foundation on El Camino. So it's to the public? Yes. It's right near Harvey's office. <laughs> okay, so um, at the meeting, uh, there were talks on the following topics. Mitochondrial contributions to the aging process by Raj Sohal. Cell-by-cell -cell analysis of mitochondrial mutations in mitochondrial theory of aging. This is interesting. Those of you that were at my talk several months ago, uh, when I was talking about how a mitochondrion will get us a particular mitochondrial uh, mutation and it will spread throughout the cell until the whole cell is completely sick from this mitochondrial mutation spreading through the cell. Um, Konstantin Krafko at Harvard actually took two different aliquots of, of cytoplasm from the same cell, which is extremely hard to do, and amplified the mitochondrial DNA and proved that in these six cells, it was all the same mutation that had clonally replicated, uh, which is a, a tour de force of uh, micro manipulation. And that it wasn't just an accumulation of random di uh, mutations, but the same mutation had duplicated itself, which is um, quite interesting from a theoretical standpoint of what's going on, and is one of the key keys to what I want to research and develop a, a, an intervention for with the uh, biotech startup. Uh, but the, the different mutations in different cells. I'm sorry? Different mutations in different cells. Right, but within a single cell, yeah. that mutation, whatever mutation it started with, spread throughout the cell. Who was the, the fellow you, you referenced? Krapko, Konstantin Krapko, with a K, K-H-R-A-P-K-O. Um, and he's at Harvard uh, University Medical School. Now, Judd Aiken did some similar studies. Uh, now, Judd worked with muscle cells. And those of you that had biology will know that our muscle cells can be rather long fibers with many nuclei. And he found that in young people, there were very few mutations in the muscle tissue. And he did some laborious work by looking in rat um, skeletal muscle and slicing up serial sections, thousands of them, and having his graduate students looking through the microscope so that they could follow individual muscle fibers all the way through. And they would find that you have normal section of fiber, then it would get thin, and there'd be mitochondrial deletions, and then it would become normal again. And in young people, there weren't any deletions at all. In middle-aged people, there were a few of these rather narrow sections. And in older people, it, there were these longer sections. And the clear implication is that the mitochondrial mutation in this muscle fiber is growing with age, and that this may be a major factor in sarcopenia and is another reason why I'm very interested to develop a drug that will interfere with that process. Um, there is uh, some theoretical work on models of neurodegenerative disease, uh, free radical dependent uh, interactions with the um, uh, apoptosis factors BCL2 and NF-kappa B, which those of you who are um, reading science journals see this all the time in uh, association with studying 
cancer development and killing off of cancer cells. So there seems to be somewhat of a balancing act that the cells in the body have to do between killing a defective cell before it becomes cancerous and keeping it alive so we don't lose too many cells. And um, there may be a little bit of fine tuning that we have an opportunity to develop in the near future that will allow us to live longer without developing more cancers. Because cancer can really be thought of as another disease of aging. If you look at the average age of most cancer onsets, it's in most cases, except for childhood hereditary cancers, it's rather late in life. Uh, there was a, a several talks on Alzheimer's disease, uh, differential responses of, to oxidative stress in the brain of normal aged humans versus Alzheimer's disease. And it showed that normal brain tissue is more resilient if you uh, insult it with an oxidatively stressing chemical versus Alzheimer's cells. Um, cells from an Alzheimer's brain uh, go get pushed into cell death much more easily. And the implication here is that Alzheimer's is a disease of oxidative stress. And this was uh, reinforced by another talk a bit later on um, by Mark Smith from Case Western, who um, put forth a proposition with a number of uh, pieces of evidence to support his theory or hypothesis that um, the plaques and tangles that we read about in every article on Alzheimer's disease are a secondary consequence and may actually be neuroprotective. They may be actually be a desperate attempt by the cells to protect themselves from oxidative stress, and that it's really the oxidative stress that's killing the cells, and not the plaques and tangles which have been so bad mouthed in many articles. So this was a this was one of the most exciting papers of the whole conference. Uh, John, a question. Yeah. Uh, isn't oxidative stress going on all the time from when you're born? Yeah, but to greater and lesser extents. And oxidative stress well, is really... What's making it be greater as you age? Uh, oxidative stress really has two meanings, and some people sort of lump them together. But you've got balancing of oxidized and reduced chemicals, like glutathione and uh, 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 vitamin C. They all have an oxidized state and a reduced state. And when you look at the balance between them, people talk about the redox couple or the redox poise. And older people have a more oxidized balance, and younger people have a more reduced balance. And one of the things that we do when we take antioxidants and vitamins is to help push our balance more towards a reduced state. Now, the other factor that also gets given the same name as oxidative stress, but is only partially related to it, is damage to proteins, damage to lipids, damage to DNA caused by oxygen molecules or related molecules attaching to them. And these are caused, called damaged macromolecules or oxidized macromolecules or um, ketones and aldehydes that build up as a result of rancidification spreading. And in fact, when a fat gets oxidized, it's able to start a chain reaction oxidizing the fat next to it and still stay oxidized itself. And you end up with pinholes and membranes which start to leak um, ions which are essential for keeping the cell healthy. Uh, so that's another kind of oxidative stress caused by macromolecular damage, which can somewhat affect this redox balance as well. And they both get given the name oxidative stress. Now, in older and older people, some of the molecules are recycled rather rapidly. Okay? Proteins, when they're damaged, can be recycled within a matter of minutes. And there are a couple of systems in the body that do this recycling. There's the proteasome and the lysosome. Uh, other molecules stay around for a much longer time. DNA stays around for the life of the cell. There are some DNA repair enzymes in the nucleus but there are very few DNA repair enzymes in the mitochondria, which has its own DNA. So you get DNA molecules which get damaged by oxidative damage, and they don't get repaired. And then there are molecules outside the cell, the collagen and elastin, which hold the muscles to the bones and, and encases the aorta and the blood vessels. 
they get um, oxidatively damaged and they don't get turned over for a very long time. And you end up with more stiffness and stiff arteries and uh, high blood pressure and all sorts of things like that. So one of the theories is that it's the lung like damaged molecules that are damaged as a result of oxidative stress which tend to feed into the accumulating damage of aging. So we're starting to come up with a new paradigm of aging where it's not just the rate of oxidative stress, but it's the size of the pile of junk that's really what you notice when you notice uh, the damage of aging. And that young people may be generating free radicals almost as fast as old people. Additional experiments went on where they, so they partially calorically restricted the controls just so they wouldn't be obese, and then they further calorically restricted the experimentals, and they still live longer. So that was interesting. But what Don Ingram has been doing recently is um, they call it every other day feeding. Hmm. They take a group of experimental animals, mostly they're doing this in rats, and in the EOD, every other day group, Every other day, they get no food at all, but as much water as they want. And on alternate days, they can choose whatever food they want, eat as much as they want of it for two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. So they're not even restricted in their total calories beyond what they would choose to eat every other day for these two two-hour meals. And they were living much longer and much healthier lives than either the ad-lib animals or the partially calorically restricted animals, or the fully calorically restricted animals. Now, think about that and its implications. And uh, We don't know if this will extrapolate to primates and humans yet, but I thought it was very interesting research that uh, had not previously been published. How much longer? Like, uh, <coughs> caloric restricted compared with ad lib, live um, uh, 20 to 30 percent longer and every other day animals were living like 60% longer than ad lib or 30% longer wow. than normal caloric restricted. But um, uh, that's from birth. Yeah, there's still a lot of, um, uh, still a lot of uh, questions about what happens with us old guys who uh, haven't started to take care of ourselves until we started to notice aging because we were so immortal when we were young. <laughs> and this gets back to this model I was talking about where you've got the, the oxidative stress engine running and it's building up the junk pile. And as we get old, we've got this big junk pile. The oxidative stress engine may be producing a few more, anti a few more oxidants than when we were young, but the problem is the pile is so big um, that I think we really have to well, the reason that I started Legendary Pharmaceuticals was to develop drugs which will actually get rid of the junk. Yeah? When animals starve, do they get rid of any junk? <clears throat> There's an increase in damaged protein recycling by the proteasome and the lysosome under conditions of starvation. And this protein turnover may be an important factor. Also, on their starvation days, their blood glucose levels are lower, their insulin levels are lower and to the extent that glycation is an important factor in aging or hormone signaling from IGF or insulin may be important factors um, in aging. Both of those things are reduced in caloric restriction and in every other day feeding. So there is likely to be a combination of benefits from eating less or eating every other day if people are like rats, which we haven't proven yet. But those of you that are feeling experimentally inclined might want to consider skipping breakfast every other day and see if you feel better or worse. Now some people just they get hypoglycemia and they can't handle it. So everybody's a little bit different and some people will do better on this this experiment than others and if you're, if you're killing yourself with fasting then don't do it but a lot of people seem to report some benefits from moderate occasional fasting. Harvey? It's a very serious <laughs> follow up with the orthodox theory. It says that one should, should never be hungry, and the implication is that the insulin levels <coughs> rise, and insulin does damage by itself. What do you think of that idea? I'm just reporting on the results with these rats, and you starve them every other day, and they're a lot healthier. Okay. <laughs> so, 
I don't know about that. <laughs> Okay, so I went through these topics already. Alzheimer's disease, oxidative stress, blueberries, strawberries, purple grapes, green tea, white tea, black tea, what carrots. White tea? white tea? I couldn't define it, but there's a kind of tea called white tea. Alicia, what's a, what is white tea? It's a, it's a kind of green tea. It's, it's a very, very mild form of green tea. It's less caffeine in it than green tea or black tea. It has something to do with the way the leaves are processed. Right. Because when you, pick the leaves and just dry them, it's called green tea. And if you dry them in a sealed can so they ferment, it's black tea. And I guess white tea is somewhere in between? Or, it's, it's, um, or oolong is in between? Yeah, it, oolong is in between. White tea is processed less than green tea. It's more mild than green tea. So these are some of the, the best antioxidant foods that you can find in your local supermarket. Spinach, tomatoes, mm -hmm. Tomato sauce is actually more bioavailable than raw tomatoes. Carrots, green tea, black tea, white tea, fresh or frozen fruits, uh, blueberries, strawberries, purple grapes. Apples are good too. So you're probably wondering, I guess all fruits and vegetables are great, right? Yep. They, um, they did an experiment where they needed a control group and they wondered if maybe just the novelty of having a new kind of fruit like blueberry was good. Oh, by the way, they did do some late in life feeding for blueberries and they found some reversal of brain damage late in life. So it's not all just feeding from infants, infancy. So, okay, so they thought, well, giving them blueberries late in life, well, we know if we give them toys to play with and <coughs> wheels to run on, that that builds brains, right? So maybe giving them blueberries, <coughs> it's just a new food they've never seen before, that's responsible for the effect. So they said, let's give them cucumbers. They gave them cucumbers, which they'd never seen in their life, so it was novel, no effect. So cucumbers don't build brains, blueberries do. <laughs> Got it. John, I read where, uh, I don't know if we're true or not, if you have a comment that black tea, like Lipton tea, was just as good as green tea, all Lip tea. Okay, black tea, like Lipton tea, has a different set of antioxidants than green tea, they're both beneficial, and I take both every day myself. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The whole point about taking green tea or, or other types of tea, what, uh, the, you can imagine how small an amount of the actual chemical you're getting by uh, after it goes through the tea bag and everything else and into the liquid. Yeah. What I do that I think is, is a much better system is I take the tea itself, and drop it into a salad, you never notice it, it sits there in your gut for eight hours, and my inclination is to believe that you get an awful lot more tea that way, and you'll never notice it. You get an awful lot more green tea than you would by putting a tea bag in and, and drinking a little bit of tea. Suggest, just a suggestion that if you really want to do it in big, big time, that's the way to go. Strange as it sounds, there is cultural precedent for this. If you go to San Francisco on Lombard Street, there's a Burmese restaurant called the Irrawaddy, and one of the salads on the menu is tea salad. And it's not dried green tea like you'd get in a can or a tea bag, but it's actually fresh, tender buds of, of the tea bush. And it's quite tasty. Yeah? Two different uh, foods that come in from overseas that are making headlines someplace is pomegranates. People from Israel are uh, exporting pomegranate juice and they say great things about it. And when I was down in Tahiti last year, they have a fruit called the noni, N-O-N-I, which you can pick up on your website if you want to take a look at it, which is supposed to reduce diabetes. I'll make another that. It's a, a primarily a serotonin booster. So it increases uh, the ability of your blood cells to carry oxygen, among other things. The pomegranate or the noni? The noni. Okay. Okay. It's Melaleuca species. Um, I just found, I, I was searching for something, and I stumbled on uh, arsenic levels in foods. And I noticed that on the noni, or the Melaleuca, it was real high. So, That's interesting. And of course we know that the, the arsenic causes cerebral atherosclerosis. 
Well, arsenic, like lead and mercury, is a heavy metal toxin that can accumulate. And so, if, even if you're getting low levels of it over a long period of time, you can build up high levels. So, that would be something you pro probably want to watch out for. On the other hand, because it works by a free radical mechanism, it's probably acting through causing oxidative stress, similar to the Fenton reaction. And tiny amounts of stress are actually beneficial because they stimulate the body to turn on genes which make more endogenous antioxidants like SOD. So there's so much swirling around of interactions going on here that sometimes the straightforward explanation is not, not the one you think it is. And um, it's entirely possible that exercise exerts its benefit by creating a certain amount of free radical stress which causes the body to create more SOD and other antioxidants. So I can't say for sure that the noni is bad just because it has some arsenic, but I'd certainly want to look carefully into it before, before I endorsed it either. Um, Lawrence, did you have any information on arsenic levels? Well, the only thing I know is that um, mountain climbers in the Alps use arsenic to stimulate their thyroid glands. Ooh. Um, <laughs> but in general, it's not very good, no. <laughs> I see we have more things to study here. Yeah, John, uh, you, uh, nowadays you can just type in the arsenic eaters on a web uh, web search engine. Yeah. And there's entire groups in various pockets of the world that make a point to eat little bits of arsenic throughout their whole life. And it's apparently a tremendous anti-aging element mm -hmm. that they have to watch. And people like, how much arsenic do you eat? I mean, it's, a friend of mine told me the whole story. He studied it very carefully. So if you get the details, just type in the arsenic eaters. I think I remember somebody saying that you just don't ever stop eating arsenic. Once you start, you have to do it for the rest of your life. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> the rest of the story. Or is it anti-aging because you die prematurely? <laughs> now, there was one comment at the meeting about there was some old movie or novel called Arsenic and Old Lace yeah. in play. And I've never seen it, but they were alluding to the fact that small levels of arsenic every day can't kill you because you build up a, a resistance to it. And maybe this resistance gives you resistance to other things as well. I don't know, but uh, it's a, an intriguing know. subject. <coughs> One last question. Yeah. How long would rats live if they didn't live in a cage? You mean, would they live longer if they... It depends on whether they were in my house or not. I mean, uh, <laughs> I think if you put humans in a cage all their lives, then yeah. the stress would shorten their lives. Well, this is certainly something that uh, is worth considering as we consider the fact that laboratory rats and mice live longer than wild ones, partially for genetic reasons as well. But they, um, okay, well, if you take rats in a cage, that's a fairly restrictive cage, whether or not they have an exercise wheel. If they don't have any toys and no exercise wheel, they don't live as long as if they have an enriched environment and exercise, or either one alone. So, presumably wild rats have a very rich life as they rummage through your kitchen in the middle of the night and run out in the backyard when you turn on the light. So, I would say that probably they would live longer outside the cage. Now, that's when the arsenic <laughs> Unless you only give them a little bit every day. Schwartz, I think others who postulated that arsenic is a necessary microbrace element, but I don't know how it works. I don't know what level is, and I, I hesitate to prescribe it. Something maybe somebody will look into. Lawrence? What is the beneficial uh, part in spinach? Why, why spinach and why not other greens? This is the empirical evidence from the same group, uh, the USDA nutrition group at Tufts University, did similar experiments with um, extract, these um, Purina biscuits with the added um, blueberry, dried, freeze dried blueberries, freeze dried um, strawberries, and freeze dried spinach. And I believe that they had reason to look particularly at these because of certain um, polyphenolic compounds which give them their dark color. So they had previous feeding experiments which sort of indicated that these are the ones to zero in on and then they did the more um, carefully controlled experiments on their prime candidates. Now they did these same studies on about 12 different 
um, fruits and vegetables, and a number of the other berries were almost as good, raspberries and blackberries, and so it, to the extent that, you know, if you're going to have to choose between $5 a pound blueberries and, and $1 a pound something else that you can eat a lot more of and you're on a budget, you know, don't just stick with blueberries just because it's a little bit better than the others, but go for some variety and maybe if you really want to get into it, pick up Jim Joseph's new book. What about prunes? Prunes are really high too. Um, we don't call them prunes anymore. They're California dried plums. <laughs> and the Blueberry Association and the California Dried Plum Association are co-sponsoring next year's American Aging Association <laughs> snacks in between the talks. <laughs> so they're going to be very nutritious snacks in Baltimore next year. So, uh, yeah, uh, California dried plums are also quite good for you. <laughs> <laughs> what was the antioxidant in, um, in the green and I'm sorry, in the yellow and red ones that uh, like was you? The, no, the one that was you. Uh, it, no, it prevented macular degeneration because it didn't break down under the UV. Lutein. Lutein. It's a carrot. Lutein. It's also found in yellow corn. Is it? Yeah. Lutein is yellow. CN. Uh, so last March, the Oxygen Club of California met in um, in Santa Barbara, and uh, they're also a, a very worthwhile group. They meet for three or four days every March, uh, usually in Santa Barbara. Although next year they're going to meet in Oregon, and then they're going to come back to Santa Barbara the following year. Um, they have a website www.oxyclubcalifornia.org, and you can read about what they do. Um, many of the uh, pioneers in the field of oxidative stress research. Um, those of you who read articles citing pioneers will meet these people in person at this meeting because this is where they go to, to tell each other about their latest research. Um, uh, Enrique Cadenas and Lester Packer have been the uh, co-heads of this group for years. They recently published a compilation of the best papers in the field called Understanding the Process of Aging. It's not a cheap book, but you can find it at the medical library or, or spring. It's about a hundred bucks or so. But it's got some very rigorous research all compiled together so you don't have to go searching through the literature for individual papers. Um, there's another book I was going to mention, um, The Mitochondrial Free Radical Theory of Aging by Aubrey de Grey. Uh, which is good because the first six chapters are introductory at a level that even you or I can understand. There's a chapter on how lipids peroxidize, there's a chapter on what mitochondria are and how they divide, there's a chapter on what are the what is the history of the various theories of aging, there's a whole chapter on the mitochondrial theory of aging which is achieving more and more prominence among scientists and uh, this is a good way to get both feet into the into the field. <laughs> This one's called the Mitochondrial Free Radical Theory of Aging. Um, yes, the Mitochondrial Free Radical Theory of Aging by De Grey, D-E space G-R-E-Y. And this one is Understanding the Process of Aging by Cadena, C-A-D-E-N-A-S. They're both uh, extensively referenced to the primary literature written by very serious scientists, so it's, it's a different kind of reading than reading in Life magazine or Newsweek or, yeah. How do these things compare with Rick Dean's uh, and version guy stuff on the neuroendocrine theory of aging? Neuroendocrine theory of aging? Um, In a minute, I'm going to get to the flowchart and talk about that. So let me put you off for a couple of minutes. Uh, the mitochondria produce free radicals. The free radicals are reactive oxygen species produce damage to the macromolecules. You end up with secondary pathologies as a result of the damage and the um, changed redox potential. Mitochondrial damage occurs because of free radicals produced in the mitochondria. Um, the mitochondria turn over 
Um, now we all know that cells go through rounds of division and that some cells die off. It turns out that um, the brain and muscle cells very rarely divide except under extraordinary conditions, but nevertheless their mitochondria wear out over time, so they need to be recycled. So there's a recycling center in the cell called a lysosome that eats up the old mitochondria. The remaining mitochondria split in two and, and grow so that the cell maintains the amount of mitochondria to produce the energy it needs. Uh, when the mitochondria have damage to their DNA, um, they stop producing energy and they stop producing free radicals as well and it seems that the recycling center sees them as not damaged because they're not producing free radicals so it goes after the ones that have been working the hardest and in the next round of mitochondrial splitting and growing the ones with the damaged DNA now duplicate their DNA and it, this may be responsible for um, the clonal expansion that I talked about that Konstantin Kropko had shown in, um, in muscle cells. Um, so once the cell becomes completely mitochondrial dark or deficient, it has two choices. Either it dies, commits cell suicide, and you end up with fewer muscle cells and fewer brain cells, or it manages to limp along by pumping out free radicals into the bloodstream, which oxidize LDLs, which get eaten by other cells, thinking that this is a good source of uh, lipids for their membranes, and they end up building membranes with damaged um, lipids, and the chain of um, the pile of molecular junk and spreads throughout the body as a result. This is called the reductive hotspot hypothesis. So I mentioned this book, I mentioned that book. Um, those of you getting into this probably will want to get the textbook on molecular cell biology by 15 different authors. And uh, Steve Osted wrote a very readable book called Why We Age, which talks about the evolutionary theory of aging, which is useful in an academic standpoint to understand how aging may have arisen over the course of the evolution of the species and may give some clues to looking at long-lived birds and so forth to see how their enzymes are perhaps shaped or sequenced differently than ours and, uh, and may give us some ideas about. If you look at birds' glucose levels, they're higher than ours, yet we know that people with high glucose levels don't live as long. If you look at birds, they have higher body temperatures, they're more metabolically active, and all of this is in direct opposition to what we notice within species where the less metabolically active ones tend to live longer. So birds have something special that we need to look at, and the same may be true of long-lived rockfish as well, and several other long-lived species that live more than 100 years. So there may be something that we can learn by looking at other species and taking a look at how they put their, their um, proteins and enzymes together in the electron transport chain. John, another question. How do uh, telomeres and the hay flick limit fit into that. I'll get into that in a minute when I get over to this chart. Okay. <laughs> um, I mentioned before the Medline um, National <coughs> Library of Medicine. This is the website if you don't already have it. www.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov slash PubMed. Or just type in Google and ask for National Library of Medicine or Medline, and Google will take you right there. Um, one of the most interesting uh, sets of journal articles that I've seen in, in the past year has come from the laboratory of Dr. Bruce Ames, who uh, has a joint appointment with the UC Berkeley and the Children's Hospital Research Institute in Oakland. Um, in his lab, uh, has a number of uh, very good postdocs and senior scientists working with him. And they've been looking at what causes brain aging, particularly they're using rat models. Um, and they're seeing that the mitochondria are going downhill, as I've been talking about. And they're able to reduce to a significant extent this decline in mitochondrial um, effectiveness because the mitochondria are not properly using 
the nutrients available in the body because as they get older, the oxidative damage is deforming the enzymes so they're not the right shape to do the job they need to do. So they're less effective and they need more nutrients. Now, acetyl-L-carnitine is naturally present in all cells. Uh, well, it's called carnitine in the cells, but we take it as acetyl form so it gets through the stomach without being degraded. So acetyl-L-carnitine is fed to rats. It makes them metabolically more active so that they can bring in more nutrients and be more effective at producing the energy that the cell needs to stay healthy. And when he first started testing them on this, the mitochondrial function increased, but he saw that they were generating way more free radicals, which indicated that they were able to process more, more nutrients, but they still weren't more efficient. So they were, they were producing more smoke at the same time they were producing more fire. So they thought, well, let's take a natural antioxidant like lipoic acid which can get into the mitochondria much better than other antioxidants like uh, vitamin C which doesn't get into the mitochondria as easily. So they gave them a comp combination of acetyl L-carnitine with lipoic acid and now the mitochondrial efficiency went up from the carnitine and the free radicals were controlled by the lipoic acid and the rats as Bruce Ames allegorically said, got up and danced the Macarena. <laughs> <laughs> and lived happily ever after. And lived happily for a longer period of time. What's PBN? PBN is a synthetic spintrap nitrone antioxidant, which has been studied for about 30 years at the University of Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation by uh, Robert Floyd and his associates. Um, Another set of experiments, Bruce Ames used acetyl L-carnitine and PBN and found that was also excellent at keeping their old rats healthy and restoring the function of their mitochondria. In a third set of experiments, he used acetyl L-carnitine and a breakdown product of PBN and that likewise um, was making the old rats and their mitochondria perform excellently so my question to them was, did you try all three of these together, or all four of those things together? And the answer was no, but we should. <laughs> Good answer. PBN is interesting for another reason. PBN has been studied for 30 years, and its patents have all expired. Well, if you wanted to make your own PBN, nobody would oppose you. But no drug company has ever put it through um, clinical trials, and now that the patent's expired, no drug company is likely ever to do so. So you can make your own PBN without worrying about violating patents, but you can't um, advertise it as being beneficial to people. You don't <coughs> sell it as furniture polish or <laughs> something else. But uh, you couldn't sell it as a human drug because it's never been approved as a human drug. So to get around this, Bob Floyd co-founded a company with some money people. It's called Centaur Pharmaceuticals. It's not publicly traded because they haven't had an IPO yet. Um, but they've been doing some clinical research. They took the PBN molecule and put a couple of atoms on the side. So now it was patentable because it was a different drug. It has the same action. They claim it has better action. And maybe it does. But PBN still works very well. And maybe the Centaur chemical works a little bit better and they're putting it through clinical trials for things like um, Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases and the initial indications are that it's working very well but they've had some problems with their management apparently when the scientists brought in the money people they brought in a manager who was less than ethical and ended up absconding with a significant fraction of their funds so um, the spin trap nitrone molecules are very effective. They um, they trap free radicals. They move nit is it nitric oxide to a place where it does some signaling, which makes the cells healthier. And uh, possibly as a result of that second non-antioxidant action, the, the nitric oxide action, they've reported that it um, it decreases the incidence of cancer in these rats. And usually when, when rats live longer, the longer they live, the more the chance they have to get cancer. So PBN may be very exciting 
as an anti-cancer chemical as well as an antioxidant. And uh, I'm giving some thought to actually making some, some up in my own lab because it's so exciting. Is it already made? Uh, it requires uh, a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment and some very careful attention to detail. And um, you have to have a fume hood to exhaust uh, uh, ether, which is used in part of it, so you don't want to be smoking in the lab. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I guess if you're an organic chemist with the right equipment, it's not hard to make. And if, um, if you're a homeowner and a homemaker, it probably is hard to make. I can get it for your wholesale. <laughs> for how much? How much you want. Um, I don't even know what it is. But I've seen some of the nitrons they've used for it. I'm not sure. You can buy PVN and Sigma Aldrich chemicals for about $50, $60 a gram. And if you wanted to take very much of it, it would get expensive very fast. Um, the raw materials are probably about $2 a gram. So even if you added something for lab equipment and people to make it, you should be able to save some money by making it. If you buy it from Sigma, they can't advertise it for human use either. It says very clearly, for research use only, and you really don't know how much they've purified it as a result because they're not liable for any liability. If yeah. you get a non-profit group spreading the word, as it were, advertising, and sending people over to some source that wasn't advertising, <laughs> would that be legal? Probably, if you did it right. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So I promised to get to this chart. This is an earlier version of the chart. This is the latest version. Um, some of you saw it last time I was here. Uh, and the main growth that's occurred in this spider web since the last time I was here is that I started to put in the interventions that could help things. So all these little circles with crosses in them are inhibiting pathways. And if they're green, they're good things inhibiting bad pathways. And if they're red, they're bad things inhibiting good pathways. Um, and there really isn't time to go through all of the details of the chart. Uh, it is on my website, www.legendarypharma.com. Um, I have arranged uh, ways to print out copies of it. So after I finish my talk, if people are interested in getting printouts, uh, we can discuss how we can get them uh, printouts. Uh, but I'll just take you through the, the broader view of what's going on here. We've got the mitochondria, which are accumulating mutations in their DNA, particularly in the non-dividing cells of brain, skeletal muscle, and heart. We've got the recycling lysosomes down here, which are supposed to recycle the damaged mitochondria and the damaged proteins. We've got the proteasomes, which are supposed to recycle damaged proteins. But the proteasomes are attacked by free radicals, which we call ROS, in these red boxes here, making them unable to do their job. When a proteasome gets damaged, who recycles it? Anybody? When a proteasome is damaged, it's recycled by a lysosome, because the lysosome can swallow the whole thing. When the lysosome has swallowed enough damaged junk, um, some of the junk doesn't get properly digested and it sticks together and forms these piles of agglomerated junk, or aggregates. And the aggregates, especially when they contain heavy metals like iron, act as sources of additional free radicals. And the lysosomes get so full of the junk that they can't properly get their arms around mitochondria to swallow them. And so you've got these dysfunctional lysosomes and lipofuscin filling up the cell more and more so that the um, cell is less able to do its proper job of transmitting neural signals or contracting or pumping blood. Um, so this is sort of a, a vicious cycle that's going on, building up the accumulation of all of this stuff. Uh, over on the right-hand side of the chart in black circles are all of the secondary downstream effects of aging. And uh, there were some questions about why I haven't studied the hormones more carefully. I regard that the hormone imbalance as a secondary effect of loss of hormone-producing cells, or um, defective cells. We also have the senescence phenotype of cells, where the cells stop behaving the way they're supposed to, um, but they don't die. Instead, they start secreting 
bad cytokines and other cell signaling molecules which can impinge on the hormone systems, can impinge on skin thickness, can impinge on uh, wound healing and cancer and a whole variety of other downstream effects. Um, and that's where we find the possibility that telomeres might be involved in one aspect of aging in the dividing cells. So we've got the non-dividing cells who have problems with mitochondria and lysosomes and recycling. The dividing cells, under certain conditions, especially of oxidative stress, may have problems with um, replicative senescence and shortening of telomeres. But I hasten to add that many people looking at this problem are coming away with the conclusion that people are not dying of old age because of telomeres. That it's more likely that they're dying of old age because of the non-dividing cell pathologies. That um, when you look at mice, when you look at rats, when you look at people, generally in their bodies they still have plenty of telomeres and that the Hayflick limit may be an artifact because um, of the high oxygen conditions and stress in the Petri dish that Hayflick and his followers the people who followed his experiments uh, used. Because in your body, the cells see 2% or 1% oxygen, and in the atmosphere you see 20% oxygen. So the cells growing in the Petri dish are getting 10 times as much oxygen, and they're dying, as they're shortening their telomeres much faster than if you um, do an experiment in the Petri dish under 2% oxygen. So that answers your question about telomeres a little bit. <laughs> It may be that it's impinging on aging through this senescence phenotype, and it may be that once we solve these problems with the um, mitochondria and the lysosomes, that we'll need to look more seriously because this may come back to bite us when we're 150 years old. <laughs> and Jaron is working on it. They have some very good patents on it, and I'm going to leave that to Jaron while I focus on these two things. What's a non-dividing cell? A postmitotic or non-dividing cell is a cell that normally doesn't undergo division after adulthood. And the, the ones we're concerned with are the signaling cells in the brain and central nervous system called neurons, and the contractile cells in the skeletal and heart muscle, which are called um, muscle fibers. Yeah? Don't they undergo replacement somehow? Normally they don't. Now there is some some evidence recently that we can use certain growth factors to cause them to undergo replacement. But many of the pathologies of aging which occur, occur because they're not undergoing replacement. We um, are seeing some exciting work in the lab that is stimulating some of this regeneration to occur, some with various nerve growth factors and fibroblast, fibroblast growth factors, and some with estrogens in women and some with blueberries and rats. So there are a number of things which are stimulating replacement more than we've been seeing in the control species. Yeah? How is a muscle cell repaired and how it's ripped? I'm not an expert on muscle physiology, but uh, um, apparently they knit together and there are cells around them called satellite cells, which are, see the muscle cell in the skeletal muscle is a long spindly fiber which may have hundreds or thousands of nuclei because each nucleus takes care of its own little neighborhood within the long muscle fiber. Um, and it has been observed that under certain conditions of wound healing where there's fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor released that the little cells that are not multinucleate around it called the satellite cells undergo go around it mitosis and then migrate into the spindle of the muscle fiber and, um, and replace the damage. So it may be that these growth factors are stimulated when the wound occurs and generate the wound healing. Does that help? I mean, I'm, I'm giving sort of a cursory answer because I'm not a muscle physiologist, but that's how I understand it. Yeah, there are, there is more and more evidence that there are some, uh, some satellite cells or something analogous to satellite cells. And I've seen some evidence that under certain stimulating conditions, um, at least in the Petri dish, you can even get the neurons themselves to withdraw their processes, round up, undergo mitosis, and then send their processes out again, which is something I just saw in a quick time video on Sunday.
seems to me you could get fat cells that wouldn't divide if you had something. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's we'll talk about that later. <laughs> I'm not going to talk more about this chart right now. Those of you that want to can either get a copy or look at it on the How about the neuroendocrine? Neuro, neuro Neuroendocrine system. Yes, that's this. And as, as I mentioned, I think it's a secondary effect from loss of the cells which are producing the hormones. And uh, that's probably why we have lower hormone levels as we get older. One other important pathway here, which I alluded to earlier, is sugar in the blood um, attaches itself to proteins in the blood and proteins in the, um, the collagen lining the blood vessels. And uh, this process is called glycation. After it attaches, sometimes it comes off spontaneously, sometimes it stays on and rearranges to form um, a harmful substance called AGE, or advanced glycation end product. And the AGE can work through membrane receptors to um, uh, stimulate changes in gene expression, which can partially be responsible for things like atherosclerosis, um, stiffening of the arteries, wrinkles in the skin, cataracts in the eyes, and uh, this is what the Alpheon 7-Eleven drug is, is um, uh, shown to be effective, at least partially, in reversing the age-accumulated damage from those things. Um, oh yes, pathologies of oxidative stress. I think it's getting late and I'm going to start to wind this thing up. So approaches to intervention, there's healthy lifestyle, diet and exercise. There's traditional blueberry type, food type antioxidants. There's advanced antioxidants like the PBN and some stuff being developed in Boston by Eukaryon Corporation, which has uh, some... How do you spell that? Eukaryon? E-U-K-A-R-I-O-N e -U -K -A -R -I -O -N Corporation in Boston is testing several different molecules, they're calling them EUK8 and EUK134 and EUK189, uh, which are showing, at least in mice and in small worms, are making them live longer and uh, helping when they, uh, they subject them to artificially high induced oxidative stress to survive this artificial stress. Um, some people are working on gene therapy to upregulate the endogenous antioxidant genes, such as SOD. Interestingly enough, when you upregulate the endogenous antioxidant genes, they don't seem to live any longer. And there's some speculation that um, maybe too much antioxidants is not beneficial either, which brings us back to this idea that you've got this little met metabolic machinery throwing off sparks and smoke of oxidative stress, and you've got this pile of accumulated damage as you get older. And traditionally, all the people that have been focusing on antioxidants are trying to do something to this little machine. And maybe tinkering with the machine is not the right idea. Maybe the right idea is to let it produce as much oxidants and oxidative stress as it wants and not focus on ox antioxidants, but rather focus on getting rid of the junk heap that accumulates. So that's a, a new paradigm that's being given more and more um, credence by researchers in the field. One of those piles of junk is called lipofuscin. It's inside the cell. Lipofuscin? Lipofuscin, F-U-S-C-I-N. It's also sometimes called ceroid, C-E-R-O-I-D, in some of the journal articles. And sometimes it's just called aggregates. Ceroid? C-E-R-O-I-D, or aggregates. And it seems to be fragments of protein, <coughs> fragments of lipids that have cross-linked and bound together into a morass that the digestive enzymes are unable to take apart. So there's a tremendous opportunity for developing a drug or gene therapy which would take this stuff apart without taking the rest of our bodies apart in, in the process. Um, and the stuff outside the cell are called AGEs or cross-linked collagen. So we also need to treat the accumulation of mitochondrial DNA so we don't lose brain cells and muscle cells and so they don't become generators of uh, um, reactive hotspots of free radicals. 
Um, there's work going on by other companies in developing stem cell grafting, which uh, is important for replacing cells after they've gone away. And uh, there's hormone supplementation, which I talked about in the first part of my talk. Um, and I think this is just repetition that my goal in starting legendary pharmaceuticals is to raise sufficient capital to hire a few extremely good scientists who will um, really target their research at developing lipofuscin dissolvers and mitochondrial DNA mutation um, treatments, which I, I can't talk more about because of a patent application that I'm preparing. I talked already about the glycation, so I won't repeat that. Um, these are our favorite little organelles, the mitochondria clustered around the nucleus. They seem to communicate with the nucleus by sending it chemical signals and receiving information from the nucleus. Because if you take out half the mitochondria, the nu nucleus immediately tells the remaining ones to divide and replace themselves, which is also the part of the natural turnover process when the lysosomes eat some of the mitochondria, the remaining ones are told by the nucleus to divide and replace themselves. So this is an exciting area for further the research. mitochondria communicates with the nucleus of the cell. Yeah. And the mitochondria do quite a lot more than just generating energy. They're also responsible for storing calcium, which uh, can be released under conditions where the cell decides it's time to commit suicide. And um, the mitochondria um, store a number of um, pre-apoptotic uh, proenzymes. Uh, the microtubules are the skeleton of the cell. They give it its shape. And they were just, um, they were highlighted just so you could see the outline of the whole cell. And you could see that uh, the mitochondria are indeed mostly clustered around the nucleus. The other thing you notice is that in classical textbooks, the mitochondria usually look like little footballs, which is sort of what they look like in liver cells. But in most cells, they actually interconnected into a network, a three-dimensional meshwork, which shows up very nicely in this picture. You don't see that in any simplified book. If you go to my um, mitochondria webpage, you'll find links to a couple of research groups in um, Los Angeles and in New York State where they've done some very careful micrographs, of, uh, electron micrographs and, and fluorescence um, uh, micrographs of these mitochondria, which are outstandingly good uh, pictures. So um, right over at Stanford University, some of the best work in uh, gene therapy is taking place. Uh, Helen Blau is working on uh, ways to put genes into nerve cells and muscle cells so that they can uh, produce their own endogenous antioxidant genes and uh, possibly some of the other um, treatments that I'll be developing in the near future will be able to take advantage of advances in gene therapy. Right now, one of the problems with gene therapy is that it doesn't go into all the cells, which is fine if you want to make gene therapy to produce some insulin. You only need a few cells producing insulin, but if you want to make gene therapy to protect every cell, against its own pile of garbage, then you've got to increase the percent penetrance of your therapy so that it gets into almost all the cells. And this is, this is an exciting area for young graduate students to go into. Did you have a question? Did you mention DMAE uh, for aggregates? I uh, know that DMAE is an antioxidant that I take, but I didn't know it had any effect on aggregates. As far as I know, it doesn't have any significance. As I say, in terms of ex extracellular aggregates, the Alpheon 711 seems to be the best. And in terms of intracellular aggregates, um, there was some research 10 or 15 years ago that reported that centrophenoxine was effective, but other researchers tried to duplicate it under other conditions, and they came to the conclusion that centrophenoxine may inhibit some of the increase in some of the aggregates under artificial conditions, but they were not at all convinced that it was getting rid of aggregates. So um, there seems to be an opportunity to develop new things that are more effective than what's already available. Because if what's already available worked, we would be seeing 200-year-old people. And we don't, so we need to develop new things. 
Uh, where does the money come from? The government's putting in about 100 to 120 million dollars a year in anti-aging research. No, they hate that word, anti-aging, by the way. Into research into the biology of aging and potential therapies. Uh, foundations, Novartis Foundation, Allison Medical Foundation, and um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute is a very big foundation, but not all, they're not exclusively exclusively devoted to aging, but they do have um, some good work going on in related topics like mitochondria, which um, might be useful as a background research in some of the drug development that we're interested in. The pharmaceutical companies, well, let me get to that, okay. Um, so the National Institute on Aging is part of the National Institutes of Health their extramural program is the part that gives money away to researchers at nonprofits and academic institutes and some small developing for-profit biotech companies. They're giving away about $100 million a year. They also have an in-house branch in Baltimore where they're spending maybe $20 million a year on government-funded research by government scientists in government labs. In addition, um, the National Bureau of Standards um, has what's called CRADA, which is some sort of cooperative matching funds. In order to get this, you have to have investment capital of your own, but they will match the investment only if your idea is so bad that you can't raise the money from other sources. So if you can raise a small amount of money and you need more and nobody else will touch you, you can go to National Bureau of Standards and if they like your concept, they'll give you some money to match the money you've already raised, which is kind of interesting. It's called CRADA. Um, and uh, that may be an opportunity for me in the near future, I'm hoping. Knock on wood. Um, I mentioned the Ellison Medical Foundation, Novartis, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Pharmaceutical companies are interesting because when I go to talk to venture capitalists, um, they always want to know, how are we going to make money out of this? And you tell them, in about 10 years, the drug that you develop this year and next year will be through clinical trials and we can start selling billions of dollars worth of this drug to every person on earth because everybody doesn't want to get old. And they say, well, 10 years, huh? Um, pharmaceutical companies have a lot of money and their stock value is related to the size of the pipeline of drugs in development. So that when their stockholders read in the annual report that they have 15 drugs in development, they pay more money for that stock than if they only had three drugs in development. So they increase the size of their pipeline by signing licensing agreements with little companies like me, or little companies like Geron, or little companies like Amgen, or little companies like Genentech. <laughs> Which are not so little anymore, but at one time they were very tiny. Um, but that's how so what they like to do is to sign licensing agreements and help you to fund your research so that you can get to the point of clinical trials and if it still looks good so that you can get through clinical trials so that when you're through they have a license to use the thing that you developed with their money. And uh, there's also opportunities with overseas pharmaceutical companies to sell foreign rights. So, and uh, in some cases they will take equity positions. In some cases, they just want the license. So that there's a lot of um, negotiation that can go on between your lawyers and their lawyers about the best way to structure a deal that meets everybody's needs optimally. In terms of capital, uh, they generally uh, distinguish between angels, which are people who know you fairly well. Uh, they have a lot of personal funds, and they're looking for uh, good investment they want to bet on the next racehorse that's going to be a winner in a few years, and they understand uh, there are going to be some ups and downs. Sometimes the angels want to be on your board. Sometimes the angels want to be in your lab every day or every week. Um, the VCs are larger companies. They um, oftentimes have shareholders who have invested in them, and they have professional teams of analysts who look at companies. They often will not make an investment smaller than $10 million because it's not worth their time to do their due diligence to study a company for a $100,000 investment. So generally,
companies starting out will get their initial funding from angels. They'll um, sign agreements with them that provide for attractive um, stockholder benefits as the company grows. The next stage is the VCs, and at a certain point, um, the company considers whether they want to trade on the stock exchange or on the NASDAQ. That's called going public. They have to file a lot more stuff to um, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Sometimes, like Centaur, they won't go public, but they'll sign licensing agreements with the big pharmas, and they'll get all the money they need um, to do what they need to do that way. Uh, finally, I'll just uh, thank the, those uh, far-sighted and intelligent scientists who've joined my scientific advisory board and believe in what I'm doing. Ruth Brunk of Sweden, Judith Campisi, who has been at Lawrence Berkeley Labs and is now part-time at the Buck Institute for Age Research in Novato. Richard Cawthon at the uh, University of Utah, Ana Maria Cuervo, who recently left Tufts University and is now starting a lab uh, in um, New York City at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Aubrey de Grey is uh, at Cambridge in England. Ron Guerin is an MD down in Monterey. John Guerin, uh, no relation, spelled differently, is the uh, director of the Centenarian Rockfish Project, who's um, raising enthusiasm and research projects related to studying animals that live more than 100 years. Uh, Ken Hensley is at the Oklahoma Medical Research Institute. Alan Hipkiss is at the University of London. Zhang Kang Lu is in Bruce Ames' lab in Oakland and Berkeley. Uh, Gerald McLaughlin is a scientific uh, review administrator at the National Institutes of Health in the Bethesda, Maryland, uh, Rockville, Maryland. Uh, Charles Osman is a futurist in Berkeley and San Francisco. Kamala Rose is a clinical medical doctor in uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, Mark Smith is at Case Western Reserve University and uh, did that interesting work on Alzheimer's that I reported on today. Alexei Terman works with Ulf Brunk at the University of Linterping in Sweden on uh, lice Lipofussin and lysosomes, these are two of the world's top researchers in that field. And uh, John Weiss is a mitochondrial expert at the University of California at Irvine. And uh, that's the end of my talk, and I've gone way over time. So I think maybe it's time to let those people that need to leave, leave. And those people that want to look at some of these books and articles, come up and look at these books and articles. And those people that want to talk to each other or use the bathrooms, you're free to go. Bill Miller, so uh, don't miss it. I've got videos of last month's presentation by Ashley. Oh, man, great. Yeah. It's okay. I'm pretty good at raining you in. That's good, yeah. So thank God. What, what was it that was holding things up? Did you ever figure it out? Um, we had to turn that one off. They started without you know, two cable connections. Oh, yeah. And then after both machines are on, we can put oh, okay. like, this one just to like, look it up. You got four of them. So it's a three step process.